Greetings, folks. It's Professor Fiore back. And no, we're not going to do the entire The Deathless Horsey. Instead, we're going to continue with our C programming, talking about pointers and addresses. All right. We've alluded to this before. What are we talking about in terms of pointers and addresses? All right, so what's a pointer? Well, a pointer basically is a variable that holds the address of another variable. Now, that's an important thing to remember because all pointers are the same size. In other words, they take up the same number of bytes because every single byte in a computer or a microcontroller has a specific distinct address associated with it, every single byte. So if I have a 32-bit piece of hardware, then every single pointer has to be able to hold every single address, meaning it's got to be 32 bits in size. If I have a 64-bit operating system, then it's got to be 64 bits in size. If it's a little microcontroller that's 16 bits, then it's got to be 16 bits in size. It's got to be at least as big so that it can hold all possible addresses. All right. So as an example, suppose we have a variable, let's say um, it's an int that happens to be 32 bits. Okay, so I'll just say it's variable A and it's at memory location, let's say 1000. All right, so if that's the case, if it starts at memory location 1000, that means it actually holds data in 1000, 1001, 1002, and 1003, right? Because it's a 32-bit, 4-byte variable. So there's four bytes right in a row, okay? Now, I can have another um, variable, different kind of variable. Let's say it's a double. So double is going to be 64 bits. Let's call that B. Maybe that's at location, I don't know, location 1500. Okay, so what's that going to do? It's going to start at 1500. It's going to be at 1501, 02, 03, 04, 05, 06, and 07. Okay. All right. Now, if this is a 64-bit operating system, 64-bit hardware, then we have a pointer that can hold any of these addresses. So this thing is going to take itself eight bytes. All right. So let's say we declare a pointer to a, a, a short int. Now, how do we do that? Or I'll tell you what, let's just use the int that we had up here. Okay. So that's a, a normal quote unquote int. And we'll just say it's 32 bits. All right. So, um, the way we would do that is we put an asterisk up front. So P is not an integer, it's a pointer to an integer. If I wanted to make a pointer to a double, I'll just call it DP for double pointer, then it would look like this. If I want to create a pointer to a character, it would look like this, right? So they all have the asterisk up front. That's how you know it's a pointer. Now, as I said, all pointers are the same size. So this thing, P, this thing, DP, and this thing, CP, are all the same size. Every single one of these things is 8 bytes. Okay? All right. Now, I set this thing to the address of a variable. So continuing with... Uh, a over here and P. Okay, so let's say we have um, a declaration that looks like this. I've got int A and the pointer, oops, pointer P. And let's say that A is at location 1000. And let's say that P happens to be sitting at 
memory address 2000. Okay. I have a little bit of code. I say, all right, A gets seven. So I know at memory location 1000, there's a seven. All right, so I'm gonna make like a little map over here. I'm gonna say, here's memory location 1000. What's actually in there? The number seven. Now granted, this actually takes up four bytes. It's not literally at 1000, it's at 1000, 1001, 1002, and 1003. But altogether, all right, those four bytes make up an integer, and what's stored there is the number seven. Meanwhile, at address 2000, I have this pointer. Okay, I've got this guy. What's in there? Well, right now, you know, nothing really. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say the pointer is going to get the address of A. All right, remember the uh, ampersand over here is address of. Okay, so what's in this location now? Well, it's the address of A. A happens to be at location 1000. So there you go. So all pointers contain the addresses of other variables. Key thing. All right. All right. So it's kind of like, um, think of it like a mailbox. In other words, it's not the letter in the mailbox, it's the mailbox itself, right? It tells you where to get the mail, right? It tells you where to get this thing. All right. If, if you did something kind of goofy, like if you did this, first of all, the compiler is going to complain about that because they're not the right kinds of things, right? One of these things is a pointer and one of these things is an integer. So, and they're different sizes. You know, if this is, as we said, a 64-bit um, operating system and hardware, uh... You know, this thing is an 8-byte variable, and yet A is uh, the standard int is a 32-bit or 4-byte variable. You know, they're not really compatible, so you're going to get a warning or an error on that. Um, and even if you forced it, like you did a cast or something to, to force it, what you wind up with in P is the number 7, right? Because just plain old A is the contents of A. So I'd have a 7 over here. What the heck is that as an address? What's at address 7? I have no idea what's address what's at address seven. It might even be code, right? And I certainly wouldn't want to start monkeying with code while I'm running that code. It would be kind of like trying to paint your car while you're going down the freeway, right? That would be nuts. Not highly successful. Definitely there are problems. Okay. How do um how do I manipulate that? How do I get the value, in other words, that P is pointing to? Well, that's called dereferencing. We're going to dereference the pointer. Oops. Dereference? No, that would be something else. Hey, I got an invisible N. All right. So you're going to dereference the pointer. How do you do that? If I want to get the value, you put the asterisk back up front again. So you could say something like this. X gets value at P. So when you see that asterisk, think of this as value at, or very value referred to by, something like that. All right, so this says, don't give me P. You know, don't, don't give me the um, up here, right? Don't give me 2,000. Don't give me 1,000. Give me what's at this address, right? What's the contents of P, right? If you just said right now, print P, you're gonna get the thousand. If you say print asterisk P, then you're gonna get the thing that P points to. In other words, the address at P is a thousand, so go to a thousand, that's the value there, seven, right? So if you print that, right? If you print, I won't do actual code here, but if you printed um, P, you would get 1,000 if you printed value P, you'd get 7, all right? All right, now right now this might seem a little arcane, but just sort of bear with me. This is going to make a lot of sense, and it's going to turn out to be extraordinarily useful because of something called pointer math. If you incremented A, 
All right, let's continue with our code from up here. If you incremented A right now, what would you get? All right, it was seven. If you increment it, you get eight, right? Pretty straightforward. All right, what happens if I increment P? Well, you might think that this would go to, you know, 1,001, right? Because P itself, the contents of P is 1,000. Um, is that what would happen? No. Actually, what ends up happening is this thing jumps up to 1,004. Now, why 1,004? Because this thing points to, right, P points to an integer. How big is an integer? Four bytes. So essentially what this is doing is it's going to where the next integer would be. In other words, if the thing this points to was an array, then we would have a whole bunch of um, items over here, right? So at 1,004, we could have another number, right? It would actually be 4, 5, 6, and 7. And then at location 1,008, we could have another number and so on and so on and so on and so on, right? That's how, that's how an array is going to be built. So when you do this, when you say P++, it simply goes to the next one in the list. So you don't have to sit there and think, oh, well, that was at memory location 1,000, and these are four bytes each, so that's, you know, i got to multiply, and up I go, right? It does it for you automatically. So you can um, sort of increment and get the value very quickly by doing something like this. Okay, oops, the cap there, sorry. So what does this do? This pulls the value of P, right? It dereferences P, it gets me the value, and then it increments P. In other words, if, if we initialize this at A, in other words, at the 1,000, this would pull out the value 7, all right? We'd then increment P, so this thing would go to 1,004, and if I then, like if this was in a loop, let's say, this was in a for loop, then it would print out whatever was at 1,004, you know, whatever this number is, let's say it's 12. Then it would increment that, so it would be at 1,008, and the next time through the loop, you know, it would dereference it, and whatever this number was, you know, I don't know, 345, it would print that, and so on and so forth. So sliding your way through an array with this is like a piece of cake. It works really well. So things like strings and, uh, you know, numeric arrays, pointers are wonderful. They're also great if you have large structures. That's in a following chapter, the concept of a structure, which can be many, many bytes in size. Structures could be hundreds of bytes in size. They're aggregate data types. So they contain, oh, well, pretty much anything you want. I mean, they, they contain you know, could contain characters, short ints, long ints, doubles, floats, uh, other pointers, addresses of functions. Yes, you can have a pointer that doesn't just point to data, it points to the function. Because after all, a function starts at a certain memory location, so you can have a function pointer. You know, there's beautiful stuff you can do with this. Um, so being able to automatically increment without thinking in terms of how large is this piece of data, right? Is it a two byte int or a four byte int? Is it a four byte float or an eight, eight byte double? You know, what is it? You don't have to think about that. The pointer just does this for you automatically. Okay. All right. So I got a couple of um, uh, examples. And along the way, we bring up a new little topic here, which is conditional compilation. So the preprocessor, right, all this pound stuff, right, remember pound define and pound, pound include, there's also sort of an if version of this, pound if def, okay? So I've defined this term. It's not a numeric value. I haven't said, you know, this is equivalent to one. I just define it. The, the, the compiler understands this symbol exists, okay? So I say pound define use numeric. And then it immediately comes up and says, well, if def, in other words, if this symbol is defined, then you know, all of this stuff is included as far as my output C code. All right. And then I have this pound else. In other words, if this is not defined, we have an entirely different program down here. Right. And then there's an end if down there. So this way I can have two programs because this has a main and the other one has a main. Um, and all I have to do is just sort of monkey with this. 
pound of this this pound of fine up here this use numeric to do this version or that version so i could for example have two versions of a program you know one for a 32-bit operating system one for a 64-bit operating system and all i have to do is flip this one thing and then that you know appropriate code is used so this could be on an entire function or it could just be on you know one line of code it's up to me and most compilers will allow you to set this thing so you don't actually have to come in here which is what i'm going to do just so that you can see it and you know comment this thing out so it's going to be the second version in other words it's going to do this guy down here um, but in any case right, it's a handy little thing that preprocessor so here's my program um, all this is going to do is look at an array of doubles and it's just going to figure out what the biggest one here is so the first thing i'm going to do is is define this limit this is going to be the size of the array max values is 10. all right so here's vals it's a double in the bra and the brackets we got max val so there's 10 of these you can count up there's 10 different values right so that's how we make the array all doubles inside here we declare a pointer to a double right appropriately named pointer and then a variable called biggie which is going to hold the biggest value and then a little counter variable called i an integer so the very first thing we do is we attach pointer to vals now remember this is equivalent to saying give me the address of vals zero right so it's a little shortcut kind of like this and this sort of cancel each other out so pointer actually is the starting address of this array you know, wherever that is in memory i don't know and then the very first thing i do is i say okay take the value at that address so that's pointing to this guy right here 10.2 and that's what biggie is 10.2 this is the only variable we've had so far so i'm just going to assume this is the biggest one right it's the only one i've looked at so biggie is 10.2 right now then we come into a loop so i say okay for i is one well it's less than max val so this is going to go from one to nine basically right here's index zero index one index two da, 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 index nine right and it's going to say if the value at the pointer is bigger than biggie then we have a new biggie in other words reassign biggie to the value at the pointer so the first time through here when i is one value at pointer is going to be 53. okay all right beautiful so then what happens oh i i i, I see an error here i made a little oversight I need to increment this. So um, what I want to do is grab this value and then increment it because I don't want to check 10.2 twice. There's no point in doing that. Um, so I want to, I do want to grab 53 here. So that's what pointer is going to be pointing at is 53. Is that bigger than Biggie? Well, 53 is bigger than 10.2. So Biggie gets the value that pointer is pointing at. In other words, it gets the 53. Now what? Increment pointer. So now it's pointing at 7.7. .7. Okay, we come around here. We've incremented i. i is 2. All right, so that's, again, index 0, index 1, index 2. So now we've got the 7.7, .7 and we ask the same thing. Is that thing bigger than Biggie? Well, right now, Biggie is 53. So it's not. We don't do anything. We just increment the pointer. Now it moves over to the 80, uh, 876 and a quarter. Same thing, right? Is the value dereferencing pointer? Is that value bigger than Biggie? Yes, it is. Okay, so reassign Biggie to the value of pointer, then bump the pointer again. Now it's looking at a negative 113. And we just keep doing this until we you know run out of values, until we wind up over here. Right? When we exit, the printf just says, hey, the largest value is, you know, whatever Biggie is. Okay? All right, so let's um, run this. Oh, look, largest value is 876 and a quarter, you know, which it is. Okay. Now, if you don't believe me, you know, we could do something like this real quick. Make that 1222.9. That should be the new biggie. Yeah, there it is. All right. Beautiful. Okay. Now, this you could do without using pointers. Certainly, you could uh, just walk through vowels. In other words, you could down in here... Um, you could be looking directly at vals i, 
right? You could check to see if val i is is less than biggie, okay? Um, it would work equally well. It's, even if you have a uh, optimizing compiler, the output code would probably be the same too. If you don't, this would probably be a little bit more efficient, but a modern optimizing compiler would probably get you the same exact code. All right, let's move on to something a little bit different. Got to get rid of my thing. So now this is going to, since this isn't defined, it's not going to do this code. It's going to come down here, else do this code. I've got this big, long string. One thing I want to point out here is at the very end, right? This is one string. I've got these backslashes. So this is basically a line continuation, right? And the backslash n is the new line, of course, but this thing at the very end is just a line continuation. All right, so what does this do? I've got this little story. Um, it's going to ask you for a character. And essentially, this program is going to scan this thing, all right, and count up how many of that character you actually have in the story. So if you say, hey, I want to search for the letter G, when it's all done, it's going to tell you that there are, you know, however many Gs in this thing. Okay, now look what it does. After we get this thing called find character or find care, all right? So that's a simple character that we're going to store. I set the pointer to the be beginning of, the, of my string, which I've called story. Again, address of story zero, because you know, all of these individual characters, that's all in a big, long array, right? From some memory location all the way down. It's characters, so each one is one byte. Okay, now I say while dereference pointer. What does that mean? In other words, while I have something, remember a string is terminated with a zero, a numeric zero. So as long as there's a non-zero value, this while loop is going to go. It's going to keep on going. I don't have to know beforehand how many things there are. You know, in this thing, we knew. We knew there were 10. So you could use a little index here, set up your, you know, max value. Everything was hunky-dory. I don't want to sit here and count out all these characters. I mean, what, what if this is actually a, a novel? Okay. You're going to sit here and count up all the characters? What are you, crazy? All right. So I instead just say, is it non-zero? Right? Is, it, is it a character? Right? Is it not the null termination? All right, then let's go look at it. So here's that construct we were looking at before. Okay, value at pointer. Is that thing the same as, right? Double equals, same as the find character, the thing that you're asking for. If it is, bump up this thing called num, right? That was initialized to zero. This is the number of them that we've found. Then when we're done, we increment the pointer. So now it's pointing at the next character. So initially, we get a capital W. If you typed in a G for the find character, right, it would say, okay, the value at pointer is a capital W, that's non-zero. Is that thing the same as the G? No, it's not. So you don't do anything. Bump the pointer so it points to the next character, which happens to be an A. So the next time around, we say, well, okay, a is non-zero. Is it the same as the character of interest, the G? No, it's not. Don't do anything. Comes back up. Look at the next character. That's an L. Same deal all over again. Eventually, you know, you're going to find a G in here. Right? All the way down here, there's a G. Well, that's a capital G. Uppercase and lowercase, they're not the same numeric character. We'll talk about that in a sec. But eventually, you know, if you work through here, I assume, yeah, there's a G right there, okay? The thing that it points to is the thing you're looking for, num gets incremented. Every time it finds it, you know, remember num++ plus plus just means add one to it. So when we get all done here, num is literally the number of Gs we have, or, you know, whatever it was that we were interested in. And we just print that out, and then after it, we print out our little story too, just for fun, okay? All right, so let's um, run this up. Character, well, let's, what the heck, put in the G. Hey, there's 16 lowercase Gs, right? And here's our little story about Walter Woodchuck. Whee! All right, things to consider. All right, first of all, notice how compact and quick this is. This is 
very efficient sort of code. You're not typing a lot, and it does stuff you know, very powerful, very quick. Good stuff. All right. Things to think about. How would you modify this so that it could count up, let's say, all Ws? In other words, uppercase and lowercase. Because right now it's case sensitive. But if I want a non-case sensitive version, right? How would I do that? Well, I'll give you a little clue. There is a function called to upper that works on an individual character. There's also one called to lower. So you might look at those and look at the documentation on those. Um, another thing you might consider instead of just uh, counting them up, what if you replaced it? In other words, how would you alter this code such that for every G that it found, it replaced it with you know, a J or, or something else? How do you modify this code? That would be an interesting exercise too. All right. Um, the final interesting exercise, I think, would be to uh, finish this story. Okay. I think that's enough for today. Later. Later.